Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, uh, kind introduction. And I think, uh, yes, uh, uh, we probably kept the biggest challenge uh, for the last because climate change has been highlighted as uh, the defining challenge for uh, the, this century, as the UN Secretary General said. Uh, so uh, we would like to discuss this uh, here. So I think that uh, we have a distinguished panel and I would not like to uh, take too much time, but maybe I can share a few perspectives before I go. And I would also like to maybe do the panel a little bit different than the, the earlier panels. And I have uh, two or three specific questions for each of you so that we can have different perspectives more on the same topic. Uh, so maybe as, as a background, I, I represent UNIDO. UNIDO is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. We basically, as we say now, we do industrialization that works for markets, for environment and for people and that is very much in line with sustainability as we also see uh, discussed here. Uh, I think that low carbon is an integral part of the sustainability agenda and um, we see basically globally speaking and we can elaborate on that four levers for change and the best known are then of course energy efficiency and the change to renewables but I would not like to uh, dismiss the two other ones which I see as basically these dematerialization, so using less stuff and also closing of the material cycles. And in that sense, we just saw the presentation of this material flow analysis and so on. So in that sense, in our view, this uh, issue of low carbon is so intrinsically linked to circularity. Uh, energy efficiency, I think, though, is the uh, greatest progress so far. But, uh, and, uh, and as time and time uh, shows, there's still lots of potential. And I would like to elaborate on why is there still potential, if you have already done this for 10, 15 years, 20 years, still, every time we start looking, we find new opportunities. And I think uh, for those who have maybe followed the International Energy Agency, they came out, I think, two or three days ago, that the, the rate of energy efficiency improvements is actually dropping. So we, we, we had a long-term average of 1.5% energy efficiency improvements annually, and last year it was only 1.2%. And the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are actually calling for doubling from one and a half to three percent. So we have a globally the three percent club. So we, we need to look at, and I, I would like to uh, also ask the, the panel to look at uh, questions on how can we really accelerate this transition to energy efficiency, and in the the, uh, the parallel to that also renewables and renewables. We have all our uh, kind of uh, perceptions on what renewables should look like. So is it PV on the rooftop? Is it uh, solar thermal, which can be providing the heat and, and the hot water for processing houses? Or are we looking at bio? Are we looking at uh, wind and other solutions? So many solutions. Uh, but I, I would like to maybe start with uh, Jens Radinsky, the head of the Regional Cooperation Center, because um, uh, there were the, uh, uh, the the fashion se uh, sector basically signed a charter to commit to climate action. And I would like to ask Jens, uh, basically, that uh, yes, the Paris Agreement has, uh, uh, and the SDGs at large cannot be just a UN or a government initiative. Climate action needs industry, and industry needs also climate action to develop. So the fashion industry charter is there an exemplary achievement, but can you explain a bit on how the charter works? If it's convened by the UN, how does this work then with industry leadership? And how do you see this spill over maybe to other sectors? So if the fashion industry is leading, how is this then going to other sectors? So maybe... Okay. Um, yes, thank you very much, René, for the introduction. And uh, hello, uh, panel members and um, participants. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, join this panel. Um, as mentioned here by my UN colleague, um, I'm from the UNFCCC. Most of you may be aware of UNFCC, that's the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, in short, the UN Climate Change Secretariat. And um, yeah, besides supporting the negotiations of the countries, which was uh, our main function for a number of years, um, with the Paris Agreement, also the function of the Climate Change Secretariat has uh, increased a little bit, so we see ourselves now also as a, tr as a driver of uh, climate action and uh, increase on, of climate ambition. So um, it's been recognized by parties also with the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, and since then, uh, as you know, Paris Agreement was signed in 2015 and did into force in 
2016, and we are now approaching the very important um, first area covered by, by the national determined contributions of countries starting in 2020 to 2030. So this is basically the start of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And what uh, parties and uh, also uh, academia and uh, uh, private sector realizes, the, the challenge is huge. Um, you've also mentioned why is there still so much potential why is there still so much um, to do in energy efficiency? I think for, for many years there's been a lot of talk about climate change and we are definitely moving uh, in the right direction. I mean, there's a lot of activities happening. Um, it's just maybe been underestimated that we are moving much too slow and that climate change is actually happening much faster and much extremer than um, people have thought. I think this has become very apparent also with last year's uh, 1.5 degree report from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which really proved um, that um, the goal of the Paris Agreement to the temperature goal to stay well below two degrees Celsius um, um, temperature increase is, is a very critical goal. Um, we must aim really as low as possible. 1.5 is the is the declared goal, um, and it makes a big difference whether whether we stay at 1.5 or actually even exceed two. So uh, that's it as an explanation. So we try to to get um, everyone on board, um, not only governments but private sector is really crucial. Um, private sector initiatives and this climate action campaign. Um, yeah, we're having, we also, uh, two years, almost two years back, um, convened stakeholders from um, fashion industries for dialogue in, in Bonn to see what kind of opportunities there is because there were activities here and there, but maybe as a consolidated um, effort of the industry to move forward, um, there was this, this dialogue and definitely uh, recognized that there was an appetite of the, of the industry to move forward. Uh, the discussion continued um, and eventually entered into the declaration of the charter, the uh, fashion industry charter for climate change uh, last year, uh, climate conference at COP in Katowice, um, where these uh, participants of the charter committed to a number of, of goals under the charter. Uh, I think the most um, apparent one is the um, is the reduction of 30% uh, greenhouse gas emissions by uh, 2030. So that's one of the goals, but there are others also um, to work on a pathway to a full uh, carbon neutral industry, um, which means, for example, from 2025 onwards, no more coal-powered coal uh, boiler installations. There's also some goals on transparency and reporting. Um, so um, this charter is, is actually an industry-driven charter. The UN and UN Climate Change is facilitating the work, but it's entirely driven by the industry. I'm, I'm sure we have some of the participants. Uh, I know H&M is and others uh, of you are probably signatories of the charter. Um, the participants work in in uh, working groups which are facilitated by the UN. We also make sure that the dialogue happens in an inclusive way and that reporting and promotion of the outcome is, is um, done, but then um, it's entirely um, driven by the industry. You also wanted me to go on the spillover effect or have I used up my time already? <laughs> well, this is just one industrial sector. We are definitely aiming for other sectors to, uh, to follow. Um, fashion industry is a global industry, so that makes it uh, very important to work with you. And you're also known to be a very in innovative and, and uh, leading industry, so we definitely hope uh, of, of followership of uh, other industries, and we're, we're working on it. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. So then I would like to go first to uh, Mr. Abu Kalam Azad, the principal coordinator for the SDGs from the
Prime Minister's office. And I, I think that uh, it, it's been said many times, the SDGs are basically multifaceted, and even I have gone and said, well, think of the SDGs as a, as a dice with 17 sides, so as soon as you start moving one side, the others will move. But if we zoom in as for climate action on SDG 13, so how is, uh, how is Bangladesh faring in terms of planning for decarbonization of the economy and and how how is it then moving in terms of the uh, what you see as the challenges for implementing of the NDC which I understand is currently standing at 5% uh, below business as usual without assistance and with assistance 15% so how is the planning going and what is the kind of the challenges as you see fit from the government's perspective thank you very much thank you for inviting me this event uh, it's a uh, great opportunity to discuss on climate and uh, apparels. Um, as we were hearing, and we all know, in Paris declaration, it was uh, decided, or the whole globe came to a consensus, that they will try their best to reduce uh, two degrees Celsius temperature, taking all necessary steps for doing that. And another commitment was that uh, uh, they will try hard to make it 1.5 degrees Celsius. But all we know, unfortunately, uh, the biggest carbon emitter, they told that uh, we don't want to follow this. Uh, in terms of Bangladesh, Bangladesh is one of the lowest carbon uh, emitter, which is less than 0.5 metric ton per uh, head per year. USA is uh, more than 16 metric ton per head. So we are uh, very, very less emitter. But even then, Bangladesh is very serious in terms of uh, reducing its uh, carbon emission by 5% and uh, with support 10%. Uh, in three areas, especially energy, transport, and industry. Uh, the, all these three sectors, they have planned how to reduce uh, this uh, 5%. Especially if we look into the industry, the governments. Now, here comes the energy efficiency. Our power division, they are telling that uh, as we uh, projected, the demand will rise uh, for power consumption. Uh, it is not uh, uh, being happened. So this is one of the proof that energy efficiency is very well done in the industries. Solar uh, power, solar home system in Bangladesh, we are about five million uh, solar home system and one of the largest in the whole globe. It grew very quickly. Now we are working for the industries, the feed-in tariff and uh, you see, uh, uh, you see, the opportunity is there that uh, industry can produce its electricity by solar, they can consume it, and they can exchange with the uh, uh, distribution entity. So energy efficiency and also the uh, solar energy production. Also, co-generation, not only using the uh, boiler, gas, for one purpose, but uh, we are trying to put a specific target that energy efficiency should be about 75 to 80 percent, which was earlier below 50 percent. So all these, I believe, uh, will work together. But uh, from the government, other than these industry, transport, and electricity generation. Um, you see, we are trying to get the highest efficient 
power plants. Cost will be higher, but again, the carbon emission will be the lower. For mitigation program, for adaptation program, in all the area we are working, you see huge tree plantation all over the country. So with all these, and the special targets with the industries and special with the garment sector, where they use the dye. Uh, specifically, we are sitting with the private sector that how much they individually targets to reduce their emission. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for giving that perspective and also putting in perspective that uh, the baseline current levels of emissions are uh, still very low and uh, that is of course also that uh, expected growth in the power sector which will lead to emissions increase, uh, if not done in the most efficient way. So there's a, 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 a road to go and then accommodate growth while also having reductions in emissions is, is going to be a, a, a real challenge. Um, I would like to turn to H&M, um, uh, Pierre Borgesen, Head of Sustainability. Um, we have seen many sustainability initiatives, environmental initiatives in the past on chemicals, on water, on other issues. Now coming out on uh, energy efficiency and climate with uh, uh, joining also the, uh, the charter. So I have basically have uh, two questions. So first of all, is, uh, uh, how do you see the role of leading brands like yourselves, H&M, in the implementation of this uh, uh, charter? And the second part is that uh, many in the, in the room or in the industry might feel that the commitment to be climate neutral by 2050 is already quite tough. And we have heard you this morning say that you will be uh, fast tracking this because you want to be climate neutral by 2030 and climate positive by 2040. So what is then the kind of the roadmap that you see ahead for H&M uh, and, and how can you get your supply chain, your, uh, your producers on board with achieving this. Great, so thank you for welcoming H&M and myself on this panel. Let me start with the second question first, and I'll come to the first after that, because I think that's a better order on how I would like to present my company on this. So looking at the climate situation, I think it's needless to say that it's super important we all take action. Uh, business as usual, action as usual, politics as usual, won't work for us here. Whether you look at it from a biodiversity perspective, from an environmental perspective, or an economic perspective. And we all here need to take action on it. I was asked before today, but what is actually driving H&M to put up a goal that is fast-tracking this? Uh, and I'll be very frank and give you the story behind. And it's a fairly simple, actually, exercise that we had in the company. Um, looking at the situation, it's clear that uh, the world has to commit to be well below uh, two degrees or below one and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, and also looking at it, we need to do that before 2050 or 2050 at the latest. How we want to run our business and the value chain, uh, the partners that we work with, is to demonstrate leadership and invite others to be part of that journey. So, to put it easy, that means that we need to be contributing to less than one and a half increase and do it faster than 2050, actually. But, and that makes total sense for us. If we connect that to the product that we're putting out on the market, and I, I think obviously we're part of consumption when it comes to our business. Uh, from a consumption perspective, if we look at it from a social perspective, it can be very good of contributing to welfare developments. But from a resource perspective, from, a, from an environmental perspective, consumption has huge challenges. So when it comes to the fashion industry, which is a large contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, we need to do a transformation. And that is what has been driving H&M to commit to a goal of climate positive value chain by 2040. And let me explain what that goal actually means. So H&M's own operation from an emission perspective is actually very, very small. 
uh, the emissions that are coming from the stores and the offices that we are running is less than 1% if we look on our full value chain uh, approach. So having a climate positive approach, only looking at our own company, is not leadership. It's not changing the world and it's not changing the fashion industry. But having a value chain approach, so everything from uh, the raw material, the, the cotton seed, uh, the polyester making, which is uh, currently oil-based materials, so connected to uh, emissions and such, to, to, to the other side of the value chain. So the usage of our product, uh, the washing, the laundry, the, 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 the ironing, and, and uh, the disposal, or even better, the actual the return of those fibers, the recycling of it. Uh, that we're also engaged in, is, is where we can make an impact and where we can uh, make a change. Um, if we dive into these different parts of the value chain, again, remembering that H&M's own operation is less than 1%, we find a large part of the emissions coming from the supply chain. But it's not the only part, and maybe this is a surprise to many of you, but actually approximately a fifth of the emissions are coming from the customer usage. So we need to work on that part as well. How do we motivate customers uh, to take care of the products in a different way? How do we work with different innovators, making it easier to take care of our products in a more environmentally friendly way when it comes to washing and such? And how do we, of course, enable those fibers to come back to uh, new garments? So circularity is very connected to this. Coming back to uh, the supply chain then, where a majority of the missions are. Uh, we can, of course, look into various different parts of it. The raw material, uh, or making that into a fabric, uh, which is, of course, connected to uh, dyeing, water-intense uh, processes and such, is something we absolutely need to focus on jointly. Uh, with the suppliers, with the civil society, with the government, when it comes to policy and incentives and purchasing practices. Uh, coming, coming, coming to a specific uh, area, which is also connecting to the climate charter, is the coal-fired boilers uh, that are in many suppliers. That stands for a huge part of the emissions uh, when it comes to the heating. And I'm, this is one example where it's positive for H&M and the partners that we work with to be part of the climate charter that has a commitment to phase out all coal-fired boilers or new investments in coal-fired boilers. And it's an area where we need to work together with each other. I don't think it's enough with just signing a paper where we say that shouldn't be in business anymore. How do we work with each other as a collective industry uh, enabling that from, again, purchasing practices, from policies, and, and best practices among suppliers. So with, with an agenda of, of bringing uh, uh, the garment industry to a climate-positive initiative, it's super important to have uh, industry-wide collaborations and platforms to drive that change. And the Climate Charter is one of them that is focusing on policy, the policy level, which is an important part of this. Okay, thank you. The, I, I think that you're, uh, you're right. Uh, we need um, uh, sometimes uh, also challenges, the, the, the challenges which people would say in the initially it's impossible because the, the challenge of having something impossible will also spark innovation and you say that uh, people have difficulty to see how can it be climate positive but that's also sparking the innovation to bring them people together and what you're saying that uh, this is also not something H&M or H&M in the supply chain can do alone. Yeah, Very good input there. I mean again I forgot to say when it comes to our value chain approach taking the cotton seed, the raw material, to the customer usage. That full value chain, we want that, uh, the, the, the reductions in greenhouse gases from that value chain should reduce to a larger extent 
than what they emit by themselves. That is what we mean with climate positive. Do we have the solution for that today? No, absolutely not. If we would have had that, we would have put 2020, not 2040. The world doesn't have a solution on that yet, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't set such a goal. If we set goals that are long-term, based on technology, based on know-how that we know of today, it's not bold enough, and it's not what the world needs from us as an industry. So, of course, it's absolutely needed that we come together for innovation, like you mentioned, for collaboration, for, for joint efforts on how we bring that forward and make that come to life. Okay, thank you. So we need innovation to get the deep cuts in the emissions, but uh, I think we also need to get all our manufacturers uh, on, on board with uh, starting to do the, the obvious things. So the things which we already know can be done, like you say, uh, phasing out coal-fired boilers, doing the efficient uh, uh, lighting, uh, all other related issues. So this maybe brings me to uh, Rubana Hook, the president of the BGMA, um, to say that, uh, yes, you have, uh, as a voice of the... Uh, RMG industry here in, in Bangladesh, you've taken the bold step to become partner of the, of, the, uh, of the charter and commit to the charter goal for the, all your members. So what, how do you see, what do you see as the, from the BGMA perspective as the, the biggest challenges for achieving this across the board? Because we are talking about uh, leaders and leggers. So how can we bring everybody on board with this agenda? and uh, what, what will be then the role of the BGMA to do this? So what are the challenges? What is the role of the BGMA? Well, thank you. Um, I actually was very happy when Pierre just looked at me the moment he said, purchasing practices. And he looked at me and he didn't smile. So I think there's a, the biggest challenge uh, to sustainability is the, um, is the absolute disconnect between sustainability and sourcing practices. At a time when, and I wish I were 13 year old, I wish I was uh, Greta, who could actually look at the world, and especially the mature world, and say, how dare you? And I'm not saying this to you, but she, the little girl, actually told us this, asked this question, because we have acted irresponsibly. And I'm not saying that, you know, this is the time to still pursue the same route, but it's also a time when we should remember that the President of the biggest democracy, uh, Trump just walked away from Paris Agreement a few years ago. Uh, sorry, a few hours ago. It is also a time to remember, yeah, he just walked away from Paris Agreement. It's also a time to remember that, you know, countries like Canada, um, though Trudeau has just said that, you know, he's just said that he's going to be very green, but they are the ones, including Norway, Guyana, and others, who are actually pursuing uh, crude oil production even more. Uh, so literally urging everyone to buy uh, more SUVs instead of uh, electric cars. So a portion of the world is acting absolutely irresponsibly, whereas a portion of the Eastern world, um, like Bangladesh, is actually championing the cause. My point is, there are more than 110 LEED certified factories in this country. And why is the export still going down? Where is the conscience or the collective consciousness of the Western buyers who could be buying more from Bangladesh just because we are far greener than many other production units in the other part of the world? So I question the conscience. At a time when the gentleman sitting right next to me, Mr. Abul Kalam Azad, has been championing SDG goals. And yes, we look better, and he tirelessly fights for us. But the question is, is the industry on aligning our interests? But BGMA would love to bridge the gap. And you know, if brands need to talk to the government, if institutions or foundations need to align, we would be more than happy to do the matchmaking. But everybody must have one single goal, sustainability. And sustainability, when it comes to it, it cannot be just about environment and social. It has to be economic sustainability as well. Now, I have a full list of 12-page document of BGMA, which lists literally all the initiatives that we have aligned up with. The latest was signing up uh, to the UNFCCC charter. So we are absolutely aligned. I just, uh, uh, we met the, the German uh, minister 
for trade and, and Mr. Moeller, and we just pledged that we would be pursuing his green button pledge. And we are committed to do that. And there is no dearth of um, interest or, or conviction in that. But we also must be equally incentivized. There are so many factories going green. The government has given us a tax cut on green factories. What do we get from the, from the buyers who buy from us? Why are, are our quantities going down? Why are we still absolutely racing to the bottom? These are questions that need to be asked. So BGME, as far as we're concerned, I just mentioned uh, two initiatives. Apart from that, you've, we've been part of lots of other initiatives, including trees and others, and PACT is one of the leading ones, which basically uh, is contributing a lot, and you know, there are loads of initiatives that I can actually uh, list right now. But my humble appeal still would be that while Bangladesh marches ahead with the slogan of sustainability, we would urge all our partners to also hold our hands and you know, speak in the same tone, in the same voice, because this was one field, getting green and going green, which was not prescribed by the buyers. We did it on our own. Yes, Accord and Alliance were all, they all came in, but the point is, the, only this initiative, and, and the reason why we went green is because we believe in it. We want to do good, look good, and feel good. But we also want to stay good. And if we want to stay good, we need the help of all the buyers. And it's not about only H&M and only one single buyer. There are tons of buyers who, who are actually violating. So though H&M is big with this, we should also kindly consider roping everyone else in with this. And I, I'll just conclude with one thing, and that's, uh, you know, there, there is a huge automation challenge. No matter what we say, it's going to hit us in about five to seven years or even 10. But we must be ready for that. So our latest tagline has been hashtag go human, go green. And I think that's the way to go. I think that's the collective um, voice of the industry. We would love to be a part of any green initiative in any, any sustainable practice that you would want us to be part of, but it must have a unified approach. So it must be aligned with the government. At the same time, it also must look after the interest of the industry. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and that's uh, much appreciated. And I think that uh, uh, events like today's uh, Sustainable Apparel Forum are also meant to uh, to really put a spotlight on on many of the good initiatives. And we've uh, discussed earlier this afternoon already uh, some of the procurement practices that uh, the purchasing practices uh, to to address that as a bottleneck, not just from an environmental perspective, but also in terms of the social domain and uh, and disclosure areas. Um, I think uh, that, that uh, what is clear that, uh, that there's, there's, there's progress in some areas and we should recognize that, but we should also look for areas where additional improvements are there and uh, the, the, the lead certified factories is of course looking at the building envelope. What can we then do in what is happening inside the box in terms of the process efficiencies that could be achieved? So I think that uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a picture where uh, some progress is definitely there, but I would also like to the audience or others to come in that we see some progress, but how can we accelerate that is not uh, that that we get this as, a, as an industry-wide initiative of all the garment manufacturers, all the, the, uh, the garment value chain in, uh, in uh, Bangladesh. I uh, wonder whether um, any of the other panelists would like to come in and comment first on what the others have uh, observed, and otherwise then we can also uh, ask for the, the room for some questions. Would you like to respond, Jens? Um, you know, maybe just just a, a quick one also just to iterate on what I mentioned before, the necessity to get the industry on board. And then, of course, you were mentioning industry uh, interests are very important. Um, I, I couldn't agree much more because um, what we are aiming for with the goals of the Paris Agreement is basically a, a full transition of economies, of industries, of low emission uh, economies of, of resilient societies. So definitely 
um, industries and people are, are in the center of the goals of the, of the uh, Paris Agreement. Um, and you mentioned um, one of the leaders of the biggest uh, economy of the world just walked away, and there yeah, it's true, uh, the US just yesterday announced or signed off that they want to leave the Paris Agreement. That just also tells me, because we see a lot of climate action, nevertheless, never, despite the, the federal government leaving the Paris Agreement, there's a lot of activities, even in the US, in, in non-state non actors, meaning states, cities, industries, associations. So it's very important, and that's also part of our work, to, to get these non-state actors much closer to the process, because the climate negotiations and countries' commitment is one thing, but they won't be able to do this full transition alone. That's um, why this kind of, of uh, industry initiatives are, are very important for us. And uh, once again, it's really a, a massive challenge in front of us, and uh, the time is, is uh, getting really short. As, as we've learned, we, we need to transition in the, in the next 10-something uh, uh, years. Um, the com consumer's um, choice, I think, I mean, for me, it's, it's the first time um, I'm, I'm visiting uh, Bangladesh. Uh, and I've learned a lot also with uh, discussions I had with colleagues yesterday and today. Um, I'm, I'm totally astonished and, and surprised and very positively um, uh, surprised of all the activities that are happening in the country, especially on the, the lead certification and energy efficiency. Um, I, I just think, and it's been mentioned a couple of times in this afternoon, that maybe it's not promoted enough. It's also one of the... Uh, pillars of, of such uh, charter is con uh, discussions with consumers and awareness raising. Um, I, I just think it will pay off uh, eventually because uh, you will have a, a competitive advantage in the, in the, in the midterm. Or I, I just think it may need more more awareness with the consumer. Could I just say something? Yes, yes, go ahead. Thank you. So when I mentioned Greta, I was actually uh, what I meant was. You know, we've caused it, yeah. so we might as well solve it. Yeah. And you know, denial, it cannot be a strategy, for sure. So we can't be in denial, that's for one. So as far as we are concerned from BGMEA, what we are trying to do is we are trying to map three kinds of factories. Um, first is, you know, uh, those who we will just educate on pollution control and aware just creating general awareness. The second tier would be on climate action. So obviously with more, you know, recycling and everything. And the third one is actually climate positive. So more of a circular economy. So there are all three types of factories in Bangladesh. It's just that we've never mapped them properly. So we're trying to form a, a national initiative called the RMG Sustainability Council, which will not only be looking at just the structural, electrical, and fire aspects of it, we have added two more components to it. We sincerely believe that without labor and without environment, we will never be sustainable. So I just wanted to assure you that you know, we are absolutely on track, and there is nothing that we won't do to correct situations. All I ask is that you know, the entire uh, sustainability concept has to be internalized. Yeah. It must be internalized. It must sit within the pricing structure we must be prioritized and incentivized just because we are a better country, actually probably the best amongst all the manufacturing countries that uh, any brands have, who deserve uh, more orders, more value addition. And if you don't do it, then you know, very soon we will be very discouraged. And it's not just about the big ones. It's also about the small ones. The government has a... a a program called A2I, Access to Innovation. It is under the ICT ministry. So BGMA has actually thrown an innovation challenge to A2I, and they're already working with it only on sustainability. And there has been considerable progress there. So just to assure you once again, we are on track and we are progressing. Yes. Um, I want to share another piece of information. I believe all you know, that in last September, uh, even Secretary General, uh, he called upon all the uh, head of the states to 
declare additional uh, uh, reduction in carbon emission. Uh, but uh, the um, picture was not very good. Um, uh, even Secretary General uh, frustratedly find that uh, very less uh, commitment was there. There was a special climate uh, change, uh, uh, seem, um, conference uh, in even General Assembly. In terms of Bangladesh, the question of sustainability, as Ms. Rubana uh, is, uh, uh, was uh, telling about, uh, not only uh, uh, in terms of climate, in terms of, uh, uh, you see, efficiency, uh, we need to look into beyond the, uh, uh, you see, climate change. Because uh, we need to look into the fourth industrial revolution, that's a different chapter. But that time, uh, when, uh, as and when you start implementing the uh, uh, robotics, robots, uh, 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 blockchains, machine language, and all these, so you need to consume much more electricity in terms of less using the manpower. So here is another challenge we have. So we need to look into that also. Uh, that only not the climate change issue. The sustainability issue is uh, how to uh, uh, make our uh, production cost more le less uh, and uh, more competitive in the global market. Uh, none of the uh, global champions, they will give you more money. They are not going to. But uh, the question is, you need to snatch money from him. He is not, he is not going to give you, uh, 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 in, in general terms, uh, business as usual. So we need to create such, such a situation that we are more competitive. Uh, in which way? In terms of energy efficiency and in terms of, again, support from the government, how we can be more efficient. I was talking with some of the young friends before coming to DAS that uh, our labors, are they uh, uh, efficient enough for uh, competitive production? We need to look into this also, how to make them more efficient. Thank you. We need to snatch money in which way? That um, this is the global demand. 4.5 million workers in Bangladesh. And uh, we are going green. We are uh, adopting the highest uh, standard of environmental aspects. So obviously, we need green price. Uh, the green factory, green production, green price. Uh, obviously, uh, my, my uh, idea is, uh, why don't you put a special tag on the products of a garment which has the uh, uh, green manufacturing uh, processes? So I believe the whole globe will be ready to spend extra money for that garment. If one garment is a general garment, and if another is the green, so put a st uh, sticker on green. So I believe the whole globe is ready to spend more money. My idea is, please, try to find out innovative ways how to encourage the green industries locally and also internationally. Thank you. Thank you. So there are many topics to touch upon here, and I will touch upon a few of them uh, to spare some time also for questions and such. And, I will start uh, with applauding uh, the industry in Bangladesh to having a lot of lead certified factories. I represent a brand that has grown in Bangladesh and we will, Bangladesh will continue to be a very important market for us. That is also why it's very important for us to understand how the continued growth will look like in Bangladesh. 
And I'm very keen to work together with uh, BGMEA to understand how that growth plan will look like in terms of resources, in terms of water situation when it comes to the groundwater, in terms of waste management, in terms of industrial relationships when it comes to the workforce and how wages will develop. And of course, also purchasing practices for the brands and how we are to relate to each other as business partners. H&M has committed to work on our purchasing practice within the Initiative Act. Uh, and we will, of course, continue to do so. Coming to um, what you mentioned about putting a green tag and uh, relating it to the price, we have done that for a long time. Uh, and I will say two things here. H&M works strategically with our best partners. Uh, and you have to perform on various uh, components in order to achieve a higher ranking within our supplier relationship management, where sustainability is a crucial part of that. And of course, if you do have practices, uh, and that goes for many different areas, quality is a very important piece, durability is a very important piece when it comes to sustainability as well. So if you perform well, you are earning with H&M a higher grade in our supplier relationship management which will enable you to uh, larger production, uh, stable, uh, a more stable planning, and so on. I guess that's bell uh, is, uh, is to start cutting off. Uh, <laughs> but of course, the investments that we have in sustainability office is huge when it comes to our company. Our commitment to only have recycled or more sustainable materials, uh, where we only have recycled or sustainable cotton by 2020 and all materials by 2030 are huge investments that we want to be leading the industry forward. There are many, many more things to say, but I assume we need to spare some time. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I think we got the uh, silent, but uh, well, it's more silent than in the morning, the warning that we need to wrap up. So I, I would maybe make a, a few observations. I think that it's clear that we, we have a call for action for all. So it's the manufacturers, it's the buyers, the brands, it's also the consumers who perhaps don't immediately associate fashion with a high impact on climate change, which is, a, I think, is also still a perception problem. And what you're saying is also that we need to, to appeal also to the policymakers and the people who are planning for growth of the sector, what are then the resource requirements and how can we uh, deal with climate? So, so I think the call for action is clear. And it's also clear that we are, uh, what the, the Secretary General is saying, that it seems like climate change is something that we can win, but we are about to lose if we don't take more action. And in that sense, it's also clear that we cannot just bang on one, uh, bet on one horse. We need to do a comprehensive approach uh, to, to look at the, uh, the, the, the factories, to look at the processes, energy efficiency, resource efficiency, renewables, and so on. I, I tend to come from a bit of a practical background, and I think yeah, we have a lot of informational things that can be done. So why can't we get some of the good practices which exist mainstreamed and scaled up and speed up. So uh, there is some which, Pierre, you were also referring on things that we don't know yet, but there's a lot that we know. Uh, what can we do there? And I think that there is some things which are basically linked to a lack of knowledge. What can we do there to bring everybody on board? There are things where, where there's maybe still some investment risks. So what can we do a market transformation also in terms of not just the procurement practices, but how we supply solutions, the energy efficiency solutions, the renewable energy technologies. How can we make it cheaper to do the right thing? Uh, for uh, the manufacturers and then of course we have the the call for innovation because the end game we don't know we need to do that okay I'm, I get now also a bell to remind me so I would like to thank all uh, the panelists uh, and also the audience unfortunately not much chance to interact but uh, I hope you found this interesting and thank you very much <laughs>